Hi, I'm Carrie, and this is Carrie's Corner. A dear friend of mine requested that I speak about baptism in my Carrie's Corner this week. It's a broad subject to discuss in this format. I will be using a lot of scripture, so because of that, I am posting a link of the printed version so that you can look up the, script, the passages for yourself at your own leisure. Most of us have been taught so many things about baptism that we have built up preconceived opinions and beliefs that make it difficult to actually see beyond our own prejudices to see the clear truth of Scripture. The majority of people today, when they hear the words Christian baptism, automatically picture a baby being sprinkled. The reality is that nowhere in Scripture was anyone baptized by sprinkling, nor is there one instance of a baby being baptized in God's Word. The word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo. It actually means to dip or submerge. This is why Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4, and Colossians chapter 2, 11 and 12 speak of baptism as a burial. Baptize was not actually a translation, but rather a transliteration. At the time of translating the Bible into English, the practice of sprinkling had become very commonplace. Even the King of England, King James, had been sprinkled. The translators chose to not rock the boat and just use the Greek word rather than actually translate it and cause controversy. Because of this, baptism has come to be defined with whatever meaning the culture at the time recognizes. If God wanted us to be sprinkled, then he could have used the word rontismos, as he did in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. It's pretty much universally accepted that the early church did not use sprinkling for baptism. Sprinkling gradually replaced immersion in many places probably beginning about the 3rd century. Baptism in the New Testament was always administered to thinking, reasoning adults who could decide for themselves. Consider Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. The people responded by saying, Brothers, what shall we do? Acts 2.37. Peter's response is in verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. How can one repent of sin before baptism if, in fact, they do not even know what sin is. Baptism, my friends, is a decision. It takes a willingness to change, deep thought and cost counting before you take that step. How can an infant do that? I know that modern churches allow the parents and guardians to make that choice for infants, and then later the individual confirms that choice. But ask yourself this question. Where in Scripture is anyone given the right to make the choice of baptism for anyone else? Let me be completely clear. Water does not save anyone. Water is only a medium that God has commanded us to use. Frequently, I have been called a water salvationist. Nothing could be further from the truth. Water is not how you are saved. Baptism is not the how of salvation. It is the when of salvation. 
Number one, baptism is when our sins are forgiven and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of God's Spirit. That means before baptism, we are still in our sins and are not indwelled by His Spirit. Acts 2.38 says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number two, baptism is when we rise to walk in the newness of life. This means that before baptism, we were walking in the oldness of life. Consider Romans 6, 3 and 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Number three, baptism is when we become sons of God. This means that before baptism, we were not sons of God. Galatians three twenty six and 27, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Number four, baptism is when we are raised up with Christ through the working of God. This means that before baptism, we were not raised up with Christ through faith in the working of God. Colossians 2 verse 12 having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And number five, baptism is when we are saved and it is when we ask God to cleanse our conscience. Therefore, before baptism, we have a guilty conscience and we are not saved. 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know this is a lot. I encourage you to take the time to view each scripture in its context. I really hope that this is helpful. I believe with all my heart that the Word of God teaches that baptism is the point in which we come into a saving relationship with Christ. We are only able to enter into that relationship with Jesus Christ by grace. We can't enter in by our own works or goodness. Our relationship with God is made available by the precious blood of Jesus. Public opinion, centuries of practice, and the overwhelming majority of people say that none of what I have said today about baptism really matters. This is what the scripture says. What do you say? Carrie.